In this lesson, we're going to go over the most frequently tested and highest yielding areas of evidence on the bar exam in 60 minutes or less. Or in other words, we're going to go over the absolute must know stuff and evidence for the bar exam, which historically, if we look at the data, it's going to be Article 4 of the Federal Rules of Evidence and Article 8 of the Federal Rules of Evidence. Of course, Article 4 is really dealing with relevance and its limits. Article 8 dealing with hearsay, right? Typically, these are the areas on the bar exam where we're going to have the most opportunities to collect points and evidence. So these are the areas I'm really going to try to break down as best as I possibly can over the next 60 minutes or so. But with that, we can just set the timer over here to 60 minutes. Ready, set, go. So the clock has officially started. We can just jump right into evidence. So big picture, I typically tell students to think about evidence on the bar exam, kind of like hurdlers at a track meet, right? If you've never been to a track meet, no problem. Hurdles is pretty straightforward, right? The runners line up on the starting line and then prior to the race beginning, barriers are placed on the track, right? This is what makes unique, this is what makes hurdles unique as an event at a track meet, right? We have these barriers that are placed on the track. And the runners, right, the objective for each runner is to jump over each hurdle and then cross the finish line, right? Of course, whoever does this the fastest is declared the winner. But for our purposes in evidence, we're really thinking about these hurdlers, right, these runners as different pieces of evidence, right? And these pieces of evidence to ultimately be admitted into court have to get over all of these different hurdles. And the hurdles, for our purposes on the bar exam, are really the federal rules of evidence. And we're going to talk about a lot of them in this video, right? You can think about all of these rules, though, that we're going to talk about as hurdler, as hurdles that the pieces of evidence have to get over to be admitted into court. So literally, the way that this plays out, if you see evidence tested on the essay portion of the bar exam, the way you really structure your essay follows this analogy, right? Each header will be a different piece of evidence, right? And your main issue under each header is going to be whether the evidence is admissible. And all of your subheaders are just going to be the different rules of evidence. And really, what you're doing in your analysis is seeing whether those pieces of evidence can get over all the hurdles they need to get over to ultimately be admitted into court. If you find that a piece of evidence gets over all of the hurdles it needs to get over, right, then your conclusion will be okay, it is admissible in court. If you find, however, that a piece of evidence hits a hurdle and it can't get over that hurdle, right, it violates the rule, then you know, okay, in conclusion, that piece of evidence is not admissible, right? It's not going to get over all of the hurdles it needs to get over to ultimately be admitted into court. And maybe the most important part of this analogy is that usually, right, just getting over one hurdle is not enough, right? Hurdles isn't just one hurdle, right? When we think about hurdles at a track meet, there's multiple barriers placed on the track, right? In evidence, most of the time, right, pieces of evidence are going to have to get over multiple hurdles, right? Just getting over one hurdle is usually not enough to be admitted into court. We have to make sure that we're running that piece of evidence over all the necessary hurdles to get all of our points on the bar exam, right? Now, what's interesting is our first hurdle is always relevance, right? 402 of the Federal Rules of Evidence tells us that irrelevant evidence is not admissible, or in other words, right, to be admissible, evidence must be relevant, right? So our first hurdle, is always going to be rule 401, right? Under 401, evidence is relevant if it is both probative and material, right? Probative just meaning that the evidence has any tendency to make a fact more or less probable than the evidence would be without the evidence, and material just meaning that the fact that we are dealing with is a fact that is of consequence in determining the outcome of the action. Okay, so taking a step back though for one second, right, when we think about evidence and the trial process, right, what is the purpose of evidence? Why do the parties come to court and put forth evidence, right? What are they doing this for, right? Well, 
The goal of evidence, right, is to help the jury determine the facts of the case, right? The jury, we say, is the fact finder, right? The jury's job at any trial is going to be to take the evidence, right, and determine, use that evidence to determine what the facts of the case are, right? Once they determine what the facts of the case are, then they can just apply those facts to the instructions that they've been given, right, and then render a verdict. So, the point of evidence, ultimately a trial, is to help the fact finder determine the facts of the case, right? To help the jury determine what the facts of the case actually are. So what Rule 401 is basically saying is, hey, look, if we have a piece of evidence that a party is trying to admit that doesn't help the jury determine a fact of the case, right? then it's irrelevant. It's not relevant. It's not admissible because it doesn't help the jury determine a fact that is of consequence in the action, right? So that's what 401 is all about. You can think about it in terms of utility to the jury. Does this piece of evidence help the jury determine a fact that is of consequence in the action, right? That's what we're thinking about with 401, right? So we can just break down some examples, right, to really flesh this out. You know, another thing though, before we go into examples that you can think of this as, is kind of, if we have an unbiased jury, right, which presumptively we can assume that our juries on the bar exam are unbiased, right? They don't have any prejudice coming into this. Pretty much all facts start at 50-50 before any evidence has been put forth, right? You can kind of think about it like this on your head, right? Every fact that is in question, right, between the parties, right, every fact that's in dispute, well, it's 50-50, right? It's a 50% chance the fact is true. There's a 50% chance the fact is false, right? Until evidence is put forth, Right? It's all 50-50 to an unbiased jury. But as evidence starts to be introduced, right, what happens to all of these facts? Well, the needle's going to start to move, right? Well, we're 50-50 on a fact, but then evidence gets introduced. Well, in the jury's mind, right, maybe that moves the needle from 50% to 60%, right? But then there's cross-examination, and the needle swings back to 40%, right? It's this constant kind of needle you can think about as a juror who is a fact finder, right? The jury, again, is trying to determine the facts of the case. Well, you can think of it as all the facts kind of start if the facts are in dispute, right, at 50-50, right? And as evidence comes in, it's moving that needle one way or the other. The problem with 401 is, what if a piece of evidence doesn't move the needle one way or the other, right? Then we would say that's not relevant, so it's not admissible, okay? So let's look at some examples, though, to break that down. So let's say that we have a car accident, right? Defendant hits the plaintiff's car at an intersection resulting in damage. Plaintiff sues defendant for negligence, right? And let's say that the plaintiff is alleging that at the time the defendant ran through the intersection, the stoplight was red, right? That's kind of the key fact of the case. And let's say that I am a witness at the scene. So I come to court and I'm going to testify as to what I saw at this scene of the accident, right? Of this car accident. So I take the stand and I say, hey, look, you know, this was a long time ago. I can't be certain. I don't have the best vision. You know, I didn't see the whole thing. But from what I remember, right, I'm pretty sure that the light was red, right? When the defendant ran through it. Okay, so does that testimony have any tendency to make a fact more or less probable than it would be without the evidence, right? Question number one, if we're asking, is this evidence, is my testimony probative? The question is, does my testimony have any tendency to make a fact more or less probable than it would be without my testimony, right? Does it move that needle any way slightly, right? So if we say, if our starting point is, okay, well, the color of the stoplight at the time of the accident, right, there's a 50% chance it was green, a 50% chance it was red, before any, introdu any evidence is introduced, that's kind of where we're starting, right? Well, now I've come to court and I've added evidence, right? And I've said, well, from what I remember, right, I think the light was red. Well, that moves the needle a tiny bit, right? The jury gets to ultimately decide the weight of the evidence. So the jury decides how much it moves the needle. We don't really care about that for our purposes in our analysis, right? All we care is that it does move the needle, 
right? The amount, that's up to the jury. But for our purposes, right, we understand that that does move the needle. Even if it's only slight, even if I say stuff like, well, I can't be 100% sure, it was a long time ago, you know, my vision isn't the best, I only got a quick glance at it, but from what I remember, I think the light was red, well, the jury can assign whatever weight they want to that. All we care about is it does move the needle. Before we had that evidence, we were at 50-50. Now we might be at 51-49, right? It moved the needle, so it satisfies this first element, right? It does have some tendency to make the fact as to the color of the light more probable than it would be without the evidence. We would say that testimony is probative. Now, let's say I took the stem and I said something like, I'm asked, what color was the stoplight when the defendant ran through the intersection? And I say something like, oh, well, I wasn't looking, but if I had to guess, I would guess it was green, right? Does that testimony have any tendency to make a fact more or less probable than it would be without the testimony? In that case, the answer is probably no. Right, that testimony does not help the jury in any way determine what the color of the light was, right? It's pure speculation. I'm saying, well, I didn't really see it. You know, I have no personal knowledge, but I'm guessing it was maybe it was green, right? Well, that testimony has no tendency to make the fact as to the color of the light any more or less probable, right? It doesn't move the needle at all. My guess, right? Who cares about a guess? Pure speculation is not probative. It doesn't have any tendency to make a fact more or less probable than it would be without the evidence, right? So for that reason, because it cannot help the jury determine a fact, right? Me just speculating on the stand can't help the jury in any way Right, determine whether that fact is true or not because it's pure speculation, we'd say it does not have any probative value. Therefore, that testimony is not relevant under Rule 401. It's inadmissible. Right, Pure speculation is generally going to always be inadmissible under 401 because if it's truly pure speculation, right? It's just a guess, right? Well, that doesn't move the needle. A guess, if we're starting at 50-50, a guess doesn't move the needle to 51 or to 49, right? It stays at 50-50. So for that reason, it's not probative. All right, so that's our first element of a 401 analysis, right? Whether the evidence has any tendency to make a fact more or less probable than it would be without the evidence, right? Material, right, just is asking whether the fact that we're dealing with is a fact that is of consequence in determining the outcome of the action, right? So in that last example, if I'm testifying to the color of the stoplight, right, that might be the most material fact in the whole case. That goes directly to the element of the claim, right? That goes directly to the element of the claim of negligence, right? It goes to breach. So for that reason, that would be a very material fact, right? That's pretty much what the whole lawsuit comes down to. So uh, thing, facts that we would say are always material are going to be things like credibility of a witness, right? That's always a material fact. Any fact that goes to the elements of the claim or defense, always material. Any facts that go to damages in civil cases, always material facts, right? So you wanna look out for though, things that might be probative, but we don't care, right? The fact that's being proven is not a fact that is of consequence in, in determining the outcome of the action, right? We'd say that's not material. So imagine, same example, we have the car accident and the attorney asks me a very open-ended question on the stand, right? Says something like, tell me what you saw that day, the morning of the car accident, you know, tell us about what you saw that day. And so I say something like, well, I woke up in the morning, I started my day with my favorite restaurant and ate my favorite pancakes, right, at my favorite restaurant. And say so the other side immediately objects, objection, 401, right, objection, relevance, right? So is that testimony under 401 relevant? Me testifying that I ate pancakes the morning of the car accident, right? In a vacuum, that fact alone, is that fact material? Well, is that fact relevant? Well, is it probative, right? Is my eyewitness testimony that I ate pancakes that morning probative? Does that have any tendency to make the fact as to whether or not I ate pancakes that morning more or less probable? Well, yeah, it does, right? So it is probative, 
eyewitness testimony is basically always going to be probative, right? The me saying, yeah, I ate pancakes that morning makes the fact as to what I ate for breakfast that morning more probable than it would be without my testimony. Right, so what's the problem though? The problem is, does what I ate for breakfast that morning, is that a fact that is of consequence in determining this negligence action? Right, and the answer is going to be no, right? Does what I ate for breakfast that morning go to my credibility as a witness? No, not based on any facts that we have, right? Does what I ate for breakfast that morning go to an element of the claim or the defense? No, not in a negligence car action case, right? Does it go to damages, right? Could that somehow affect the amount of damages the plaintiff has sustained, right? What I ate for breakfast that morning? The answer is no. Right? So it's not material. What I ate for breakfast the morning of a car accident is not a fact that is of consequence in determining the outcome of the action. So for that reason, we'd say, okay, maybe it is probative, right? It does, my eyewitness testimony makes the fact that I ate pancakes more probable than it would be without the evidence, but it's not a fact that's of consequence in determining the outcome of the action. So it's not relevant. It's not admissible. Of course, we can always add facts and make it relevant. Imagine that I have a serious allergy to pancakes that affects my vision, it affects my eyesight, right? Well, then it would be material, right? If I have an allergy that affects my eyesight when I eat pancakes, well, of course, right? If I'm an eyewitness to the scene, well, that goes to my credibility as a witness. So me testifying that I ate pancakes the morning of the car accident, right? That goes to my credibility as a witness. So that would be a material fact, right? And we know eyewitness testimony is generally going to be probative, right? So that would then be probative and material. It's relevant, right? That testimony as to what I ate for breakfast that morning is relevant under 401 if I have a pancake allergy that affects my eyesight, right? So that's why all the facts, you know, it always has to be considered, you know, totality of the circumstances, but that is how 401 works, right? And remember, 401 is always our first hurdle, right? So if you're looking at an evidence essay, that's the first thing you do for each piece of evidence, right? You're going through Every header, remember, is all the different pieces of evidence, right? Your main issue under each header is whether the evidence is admissible, right? Your first subheader will be 401. Okay, well, the first question, the first issue is whether this piece of evidence is relevant, right? To be relevant, evidence under 401 must be probative and material. And you just go through each element. Now, if, important to recognize, if it's obviously relevant, right? If someone's testifying that they saw the defendant commit the murder in a murder trial, well, that's clearly eyewitness testimony of a material fact, right? We know that's relevant. So you can go through that analysis super quick, right? It can just be one sentence, two sentences, and then move on to the next thing. But it's still important on the bar exam on an essay to just let your grader know, hey, I know 401 is kind of this gateway issue. We always want to establish that the evidence is relevant before we move on to the next hurdle. Right? In real life, yeah, of course, everyone would understand that's relevant. We wouldn't really need to discuss it. But on the bar exam, to make sure we're getting all the points that we need to get, right? you just want to quickly be go through 401 for each piece of evidence, even if it's just one or two sentences. It's just letting your grader know, hey, look, I understand the gateway issue here is 401 relevance. And then we keep going, right? So important to recognize that 401, as we can see, is a very low threshold. Most evidence is going to pass a 401 test, right? Remember, if it just moves that needle any tiny bit, if it's 1% probative and 1% material, right? It just barely moves that needle one way or the other, right? We know it passes 401. So because it's a very low threshold, right? There has to be some limits put on this, right? And so that's what the rest of Article 4 is really dealing with, right? Limits on relevance. We have this idea of legal relevance, we have some public policy exclusions, and you have this idea of character evidence, right? How relevant is somebody's character, right? These are all things that are important, and we're gonna put them below the video, right? We're gonna have an addendum down there, you should see a link, right? That'll have all the information we need on the limits on 
relevance. In this video though, from here, I really want to focus back on hearsay, right? Important to recognize big picture, right? Hurdlers that attract me. And our first hurdle is 401 relevance, right? That's a very important thing. We've discussed that. The limits on relevance are important. You're going to want to know those. We're going to put them below the video, but for our purposes, for time's sake, right? I really want to get into hearsay here so we can spend a lot of time on hearsay because hearsay is just such a seminal topic on the bar exam. It's just one of those topics. It's kind of like negligence and torts, contract formation and contracts, right? Hearsay and evidence is just such an important concept. I want to make sure we have plenty of time to really go through all the nuances of a hearsay analysis. So make sure that you do see the addendum below the video. We're gonna have a lot more information there on relevance. There's really key stuff there to consider. But for this video, we can move on to hearsay. All right, so big picture, right? Hearsay is a two-step analysis, right? If we think about hearsay from, you know, mile high view, the starting point rule is pretty simple, right? Evidence, hearsay evidence is not admissible unless an exception applies, right? That's rule 802 of the federal rules of evidence, right? Hearsay evidence is not admissible unless an exception applies, right? So that means big picture, our hearsay analysis is two steps, right? Step number one, okay, well, is this evidence hearsay? Step number two, if it is, does an exception apply, right? So three possible outcomes. Right, number one, step number one, is it hearsay? Well, step number one, is it hearsay? The answer is either going to be yes, it is hearsay, or no, it's not hearsay. If we find after step number one, okay, no, this is not hearsay, then we're not going to step number two, right? It's not hearsay. So we don't have to think about exceptions to the hearsay rule if we find that it's not hearsay, right? So that's outcome number one. Outcome number two is, okay, it is hearsay, but we find that an exception applies, okay? So we go, oh, okay, yeah, this is hearsay, but we have an exception that applies, so it is admissible, right? It's kind of outcome number two. Outcome number three is, it is hearsay, and there's no exception that applies, so it's not admissible, right? Those are kind of the three options here. There's nothing really in between, right? Of course, remember, hearsay is just one hurdle, right? So just because we get over the hearsay hurdle doesn't mean that the evidence is automatically admissible, right? It could hit another hurdle. There could be a different problem with a different rule. Here, we're focusing though only on hearsay. Those are really, in a hearsay analysis, your only outcomes. You know, I know a lot of times students get really in the weeds on a hearsay analysis. It's easy to get kind of lost and go down paths that you really shouldn't be going down. Just remember, at its core, it's two steps, right? Is it hearsay? If so, does an exception apply, right? Our starting point rule is that hearsay evidence is not admissible unless an exception applies. That means we have two steps. So we can start with step number one first. Is it hearsay? How do we determine whether a piece of evidence is hearsay? Well, we start with 801C, right? 801C tells us, rule 801C tells us exactly what hearsay is. Rule 801D tells us what hearsay is not, right? 801D gives us some conditions and it says, hey, look, if any of these conditions are satisfied, it's categorically not hearsay. Right, but we start at 801C to identify, okay, well, what is hearsay? Where's our starting point? The answer is 801C tells us that hearsay is an out-of-court statement that is offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted in that statement. Right, so essentially three elements, right? We need an out-of-court statement <laughs> that is offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted in that statement. If those three elements are met, right, 801C is satisfied. That statement is going, that evidence is going to be hearsay unless it satisfies a condition of 801D, right? So let's break each of these elements down. What does it mean to be out of court, right? In short, to be out of court, it just means that the statement occurred outside the proceedings of the current case, right? Sometimes I tell students, you can think about this as the four walls of the courtroom, 
right? Literally, that's our courtroom. Any statements that are happening outside of court, right? Any statements that are going on out here, outside of court, right, satisfy this first element. So what about a statement that's made in the hall outside the courtroom? Is that out of court? Is it outside the proceedings of the current case? Yes, a statement that's made before the session begins, right, in the hall outside the courtroom, right, that's out of court. It's outside the proceedings of the current case, right? What about a statement that's made inside the courtroom, but it was for a different case, right? It's a different proceeding. Right, yes, that would be considered outside of court. Anything that's outside the proceedings of the current case is going to be considered out of court for hearsay purposes, right? That's usually pretty easy to see, right? Any statements that are occurring outside the proceedings of the current case are going to be considered out of court for hearsay purposes, right? And you can think about this in your head as kind of those four walls of the courtroom. Any statements that are happening outside those four walls, outside in the world, outside of these four corners of the courtroom, right, that's going to be considered out of court. Next, we need an, a, a statement, right? We need an out of court statement. Element number two, we need a statement, right? A statement is an assertion made by a human being. Important to recognize that an assertion can be oral, right? This is typically what we think about when we're thinking about hearsay, right? Oral assertions, but it can also include written assertions and nonverbal conduct that is assertive in nature, right? So, any assertion made by a human being will constitute a statement. So all of these oral statements I'm making right now out there in the world, right? All of the oral statements, this is all out of court statements. Any assertion that's made by a human being. So oral statements, written statements, written assertions. So things like letters, text messages, emails, faxes, right? All of this stuff right? Memorandums. It's all written assertions, right? Those are statements for hearsay purposes. A lot of times students forget that hearsay can be written, right? A statement that's on paper, as long as it's an assertion made by a human, pe uh, by a human being, right? Even if it's written on paper, that's still a statement for hearsay purposes, right? And even nonverbal conduct that's assertive in nature can be a statement for hearsay purposes. This would be like a thumbs up, a thumbs down, head nods, right? Yes, head nod, no head nod, right? That can be a statement if it's assertive in nature and it's made by a human being. So someone asks, you know, did you commit this murder and you nod your head up and down like this, right? That's a statement, right? That for hearsay purposes, that's an assertion made by a human being, right? So remember, oral assertions, written assertions, nonverbal conduct that's assertive in nature. All statements for hearsay purposes, so long as the assertions are made by a human being, right? So what about a dog barking? Is a dog barking a statement for hearsay purposes? The answer is no. What about the noises that different machinery make, right? You turn on a computer and it makes that startup noise, right? Is that a statement for hearsay purposes? No, right? It has to be an assertion made by a human being, right? So usually an out of court statement is easy to see, right? We can see what an out of court statement looks like. If we're outside those four corners of the courtroom, right? We're outside the proceedings of the current case and we have a oral, written, or nonverbal assertion made by a human being, right? We have an out of court statement. Those first two elements are usually pretty easy to identify. Where it gets a little bit trickier is this third element, right? We need an out of court statement that is offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted in that statement, right? So the easiest way to illustrate this is usually with examples, right? So let's say that you and I are talking. This isn't on video camera because things on video camera could affect stuff in different ways. So let's just say that we're out in the world, it's not on tape, it's not a camera, and we're just interacting, we're talking, right? And I look at you and I say that this dry erase marker is black. I'm 100% sure that my dry erase marker right here is black, right? Okay, so 
right there, that statement alone, is that state, well, is that an out of court statement, right? Let's go through the elements here, just on that, right? Is it an out of court statement, right? Well, yeah, we're not in the proceedings of any case, right? When we're just talking. So it's an out of court, is it a statement, right? Yes, it's an oral assertion. I'm looking right at you and I'm saying this dry erase marker is black, right? So it's clearly an out of court statement. Now, if we offer this statement at some future case, right, to prove that the color of this dry erase marker is black, right, say it's an important part of a contract action, right, let's say we have a contract that was written in black dry erase marker ink, and it really is important what the color of my dry erase marker is, and we have this out of court statement where I'm saying my dry erase marker is black, right, well, if we want to offer that statement, me saying that out of court statement, that I'm saying my dry erase marker is black to prove the color of my dry erase marker, then we are offering that statement to prove the truth of the matter asserted. We're offering the statement to prove the statement that my dry erase marker is black. We're offering that to prove the fact that the dry erase marker is black. Right, so we have an out of court statement and we're offering it to prove the truth of the matter asserted. Right, now let's change that slightly. Let's say instead of looking at you and saying that I'm 100% sure this dry erase marker is black, let's say I look at you and say I'm 100% sure that this dry erase marker is purple. Right, this dry erase marker, I'm looking at it, is purple. I'm 100% sure the dry erase marker is purple. Okay. So I make this statement to you, right? We have an out of court statement, but let's this time say we're not in some contract action. Let's go back to our original example. Let's say that I end up being a key witness in a negligence car action case. And the entire case comes down to the color of of the stoplight at the time the defendant ran through the intersection. And let's say I'm going to get to court and I'm going to testify that the light was red when the defendant ran through the intersection causing this car accident. Right, well, the defendant might want to introduce that out of court statement that I made to you about the color of the dry erase marker, right? So let's say that that defendant, after I make this testimony where I say, look, the light was red when the defendant ran through it, this accident is his fault, right? The defendant might wanna say, hey, look, this witness out of court was telling his buddy that he thinks this black dry erase marker is purple, right? that out of court statement they're going to want to bring in. But why are they bringing that statement in? Are they bringing that statement in to prove the color of the dry erase marker? No, right? They're not bringing in the statement in that car accident case to prove the color of a dry erase marker. They don't care what the color of this dry erase marker was. It could have been yellow, orange, whatever, right? The reason that they're bringing it in is to show that I can't tell colors apart, right? I'm here testifying that the light was red when the defendant ran through it, yet I can't tell you what color my own dry erase marker is. So they're not bringing that statement in in the car accident case to prove the color of the dry erase marker. They're bringing it in for impeachment purposes, right? They're bringing that statement in to attack my credibility as a witness, right? They're not offering the statement to prove the truth of the matter asserted in the statement. They're not bringing in that statement to prove the color of the dry erase marker. They're bringing in that statement to attack my credibility as a witness, to say, hey, look, this guy can't tell colors apart. Maybe you shouldn't trust what he's saying here on the stand as to what color the light was when I ran through it, right? That would be introducing the out of court statement to impeach a witness, which is not hearsay because it doesn't satisfy the third element. All right, so that's how hearsay works under 801C.
Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Bar Blitz video series. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire Bar Blitz video library, which includes coverage of the most frequently tested and highest yielding areas of law in each bar exam subject, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled in Studicata Bar Review to get started started with your no risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com.